I uh, have asked if everybody uh, can put their questions as we go along in the chat. And when we get to the end, we'll come back and address them all. But I'm happy to take as many questions as you have and do them as you uh, think of them at the time. Um, I am so pleased to be with everybody tonight because this is an area that uh, I feel very uh, strongly that all of us um, have a wonderful heritage who live in Cincinnati. And many of us don't know uh, that much about the heritage and especially of uh, the uh, prominence that Cincinnati had in the United States. And this talk that I'm giving tonight uh, was originally given in January of 2012 on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of an organization which you'll learn more about tonight called The Board. And The Board has been in existence now uh, close to 110 years. And in fact, one of our members in the audience tonight is a member of the board today, uh, Don Hortys. And we had a, a meeting of the board last night. This is a group of uh, 60 Jewish men who have been meeting um, roughly seven or eight times a year since 1912. And the, you'll hear more about the purpose of it. So the context is, uh, as you're listening, that this was the 100th anniversary address that I presented to that group in, 19, in 2012. So here we go. Some of those present this evening may recall a popular show from the early days of television called You Are There, hosted by Walter Cronkite. The typical episode with the muted voice of an announcer might have started off something like this. Tonight, we are in the company of several of Cincinnati's most accomplished, cultured, and preeminent citizens as they are about to launch a new literary society. They've decided to name this group simply The Board, giving no hint of the special nature of their purpose or the criteria determining who has been invited to be a member. Little do they know that their unique concept of assembling once a month to enjoy one another's fellowship and attain greater wisdom in an entertaining environment will be in existence for another 100 years. The year is 1912, and we are at the newly built Los Santiago Country Club, located in the newly annexed suburb of Pleasant Ridge. You are there. This evening, I would like to give you a glimpse into what life was like for the founders of the board. How did their lives compare to ours in terms of prosperity, social prominence, political, commercial, and professional accomplishment, as well as worldliness? My intent is to let you come to your own conclusion once we've had an opportunity to learn some of the facts of this era. Later, we will meet up close and personal, several of those who either were related to early members of the board or were contemporaries of our founders. I will be quoting directly from many sources that I have assembled for this talk. The most intriguing and the one that started me on this adventure is a four volume set ironically published in 1912 titled Cincinnati, the Queen City, edited, edited by Reverend Charles Frederick Goss. In the first volume, an entire chapter is devoted to quote, Judaism in Cincinnati, which introduces the subject this way. The relations of the Jews of Cincinnati to their fellow citizens were always peculiarly pleasant, cordial, and mutually forbearing. The growth of music, literature, art, science, commerce, charitable institutions, public schools, public organizations all grew with the spirit of and cooperation from the Jews of our city. The chapter goes on to state, quote, suffice it to say that here in civic, communal, and mercantile matters that the Jews of Cincinnati have proved themselves progressive, liberal, earnest, and sincere. As you probably have surmised, the founders of the board 
were of either German or Central European Jewish heritage. However, what may not be as well known is that almost all of them were at least second generation, and in a few cases, even third generation Americans by 1912. The question worth answering is what attracted so many of the parents of our founders to Cincinnati in the mid-1800s. Between 1850 and 1880, Cincinnati had built up an established base of cultural, charitable, and religious institutions that made it a beacon for Jews wanting to become part of a solid community outside of the teeming cities of the East Coast. In fact, by 1860, Cincinnati had the fifth largest population of Jews in the United States. With its sizable German population, Cincinnati attracted thousands of German Jews who felt comfortable in their midst. By the late 1850s, Jewish peddlers in Cincinnati had moved up to owning retail clothing businesses, as well as establishing thriving wholesale whiskey and distilling concerns. The rapid growth of these enterprises called for hiring people to work in the factories, as well as fill positions in supply routes, sales, mid-level management, credit, and back office operations. Often additional family members came directly to Cincinnati from Germany to join their relatives in these burgeoning businesses. Quickly, they found themselves acclimatized to the Cincinnati environment, both socially and economically. According to the late Dr. Jacob Marcus, the founder of the American Jewish Archives, quote, Jews outpaced non-Jews in occupational and social mobility. No other migrant group has risen so rapidly in such a short period of time as the Jews of Cincinnati, end quote. To quote Susan Myers, who was the curator of the Smithsonian exhibit several years ago on Cincinnati's Jewry and the author of The Promise of a New Life, Jewish Immigration in America, 1820 to 1880. She said, thousands of Central European Jews settled in Cincinnati, sharing with their non-Jewish residents a boomtown mentality, a sense of unlimited potential for growth and development of this gateway to the West. She goes on to point out that, quote, the Cincinnati Jewish community was well known for the economic success and philanthropy, as well as its position as the oldest and most cultured Jewish community west of the Alleghenies. As an example of the early institutional development of the Jewish community, a traveler to Cincinnati in 1860 from New York remarked in a letter home that he was amazed to find 18 Jewish charities in operation and that the Jewish population was even greater than that of Philadelphia. The typical successful German Jew of the period, as described by Dr. Marcus, was very much like my own great-grandfather, Benjamin Pritz, of whom we will hear more about later. Dr. Marcus says, quote, this person was born in Bavaria, came to the United States as an almost impoverished teenager, made his way as a merchant, moved uptown to better residential quarters, was active in his synagogue and in Jewish and non-Jewish lodges and social clubs, raised a family, and summed up his life in a sentence, quote, if you are honest and industrious, you are bound to succeed. For perspective, the Jewish population of Cincinnati in 1907 was estimated to be 22,000, not that much smaller than our Jewish population today. However, at that time, Jews were 5% of the population of metropolitan Cincinnati, while today we are slightly over 1%. On a national basis in 1907, Cincinnati represented 1.4% of the total American Jewish population, while today Cincinnati has less than 0.4% of the Jewish U.S. population. By the time of the founding of the board, Cincinnati's Jews had achieved success, status, and respect in almost every way measurable. They had served in elective office since Joseph Jonas was elected to the state legislature in 1859, and Henry Mack served on city council starting in 1860. By the last third of the 19th century and the first few years of the 20th century, it was commonplace for Jews to be in all realms of public life. 
1904 account of Cincinnati's first 100 years listed 50 different Jews who engaged in public service. Some examples included Julius Fleischmann, who was appointed as an aide to President William McKinley in 1894, Louis Krohn, who served as vice president of the Board of Supervisors in 1895. In that same year, Bernard Bettman was elected to the Board of Education and later became the United States Collector of Internal Revenue for Cincinnati. Samuel Ock and William Schroeder were also elected to the school board. Abe First was president of the fire department. Frederick Spiegel was the county solicitor, later becoming the prosecuting attorney for Hamilton County and the mayor in 1914. In 1896, Maurice J. Freiburg was appointed by the governor of Ohio to serve on the commission to plan a new waterworks for Cincinnati, the largest public waterworks project in the history of the city. Mr. Freiburg eventually became vice president of the waterworks at the time it was erected in 1909. In 1900, Alfred M. Cohn ran for mayor of Cincinnati against Julius Fleischmann, a non-practicing Jew, and barely lost. Mr. Cohn was also twice elected to, to the Ohio Senate. In 1911, he was nominated by the Democratic Party for governor of Ohio. Alfred Bettman was the Cincinnati City Solicitor and named chairman of the Ohio Association of City Solicitors in 1912. Notably, Harry Hoffheimer served in the Ohio House of Representatives, was county prosecutor, and later became a prominent judge. Cincinnati's Jews by 1912 were established leaders in a broad range of business enterprises. The industries most dominated by the Jewish ownership in Cincinnati were clothing manufacturing, distillery, and wholesale whiskey distribution, and also cigar manufacturing. In 1916, of the 120 firms engaged in the wholesale liquor and distilling business in Cincinnati, 75% were owned by Jews. According to Chamber of Commerce records, the average annual sales of whiskey were 25 million per year. Interestingly, in spite of Jews dominating the liquor business, there was only one Jewish owned brewery at a time when Cincinnati was home of over 30 major beer manufacturers. In the late 1800s, there were three sizable Jewish owned banks. Max May, writing a chapter on the Jews in the 1904 centennial history of Cincinnati, stated that, quote, the Jews play a key role in all realms of the commercial and professional life of the community. And the most prominent Jews are stockholders, officers, and members of the boards of directors of the largest national banks and trust companies. By 1912, only one bank was still headed by a Jew, People's Bank, which was run by Alfred Cohen. Although six Jews served as officers of four of the largest banks, insurance was another business where Jews were dominant. 20% of all insurance salespeople were Jewish, and they did 50% of the total insurance written. Among the Jewish-owned businesses with a national reputation were the Mosler Safe Company, Kahn Estates Stove Company, Fetchheimer Brothers Uniform Company, the Pollock Steel Company, and the Joseph Brothers Scrap Iron Company. The legal profession was also well represented as in 1917, it was recorded that there were 55 Jewish lawyers in the Bar Association. Jews had all become, also become well regarded in the medical field as Dr. Joseph Ranzelhoff was elected president of the Cincinnati Academy of Medicine in 1889. In 1903, Dr. Alfred Friedlander was a recognized leader of the medical community, having been elected to be secretary of the City Hospital Medical Library Association. Later, he became Dean of the University of Cincinnati Medical School. In an era where the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce was arguably the most powerful and prestigious organization in the city, it is quite telling that Maurice Freiburg in 1895 was selected to be the president of the chamber following what was described as a long and contentious election. His father, Julius, had been mo the most revered member of the chamber from the late 1860s. And upon Julius's death in 1904, 
was given a proclamation unlike any that had ever been issued by that body. There were well over 100 Jewish-owned businesses identifiable as members of the Chamber of Commerce in 1912. Jews were also well represented in the Businessmen's Club, the Queen City Club, and many other civic associations. All evidence points to Jewish businessmen having had extensive dealings with non-Jews in several cases, including the significant banking house of S.B. Heidelbach and Company, which later became the Ohio Valley National Bank. Jews actively partnered in business with Gentiles all over this city. Now I'd like to talk about the social situation. Dr. Marcus summarized the fruits of the business acumen of Jews of this period in this way. Quote, the new economic change brought to many a degree of success, money, comfort, and the ability to provide adequately for their children. In a negative sense, wealth often encouraged the cultivation of class distinctions, social aloofness, and the rise of exclusive clubs. In this area, Jews patterned themselves slavishly after their Gentile contemporaries. German Jewish clubs became bastions of exclusion by snubbing middle-class Jews and the newly arrived Eastern European immigrants of the late 1800s and early 1900s. In commenting on clubs like the board, Marcus says, there was hardly a town without a Jewish literary society, which often served as a club where the members produced amateur shows, read poetry, presented scholarly papers, and listened to good music. However, the programs were seldom devoted to Jewish subjects, and the clubs themselves did not have Jewish names or really anything identifying themselves as being Jewish. This was in keeping with the desire to be as American as possible. Barnett Brickner, in his 1933 PhD dissertation, The Jewish Community of Cincinnati, a Historical and Descriptive Study, 1817-1933, begins his chapter on the social and cultural life of the Cincinnati Jewish community as follows. Quote, the Jews of Cincinnati have seldom felt any lines of distinction between themselves and the non-Jews in connection with the patriotic, educational, philanthropic, and economic activities of this community. The position of the Jew in the mercantile and professional projects of the city was determined by his talent, ability, and interest in the work." End quote. Jews formed their own clubs, including the Phoenix Club, which was founded in 1856 and first met in various hotels and then built its own beautiful downtown building. Later, the Cincinnati Club was started in 1889 and had a beautiful clubhouse in Walnut Hills, but went out of existence in 1911. Originally, these clubs cultivated the arts, literary and musical activities with occasional farce comedies and concerts. Since many of the prosperous Jewish people by this time lived in the suburbs, the downtown Phoenix was on the wane, giving rise to the founding of the Los Angeles Golf Club in 1902, located first in Oakley and then moving to Pleasant Ridge in 1909 when it became a true country club. Los Angeles quickly became the center of social life for the German Jewish elite of Cincinnati. The Phoenix Club sold its building in 1912 to the Businessmen's Club of Cincinnati and moved its meetings to the Havlin Hotel. By then, its programs were failing to attract younger new members. The president of the club stated, quote, young men are not attracted to simply card playing and dining. Therefore, I propose that we invite speakers occasionally to our luncheons to stimulate the interest of our older members and encourage younger members to join us, end quote. It didn't work. Then in 1917, the Phoenix Country Club was formed with a new location in Bond Hill, eventually severing ties completely with the Phoenix Downtown Club. And it renamed itself the Hillcrest Country Club and eventually reversed the name to become the Crest Hills Country Club. The actual Downtown Phoenix Club ceased as an entity entirely in 1930. <clears throat> in my opinion, 
a unique cultural and social driving force for Cincinnati's Jewish community during the first, the, I'm sorry, the last half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century was not, as is often assumed, the desire for assimilation into the broader society. Instead, the overarching goal was one of Americanization, which was widely embraced as the pathway to acceptance. While both words begin with the letter A, they are indeed quite different in all other aspects. With few exceptions, the elite German Jewish families were not running away from their Jewishness or trying to hide it. To the contrary, they were consumed with not letting it get in the way of their blending in with their Gentile brethren in commercial, cultural, and even social pursuits of their everyday life. As Jacob Marcus states, the Gentiles were not primarily concerned with Jews as Jews, but as American citizens. They were looked at as 90% Americans and 10% Jewish. The Jews of Cincinnati were only too happy to oblige. Dr. Marcus further comments on Americanization this way, quote, if some were not particularly religious or active in the Jewish community, it's not because they were anti-Jewish or wanted to curry favor in the Gentile community. It's just that they were particularly influenced by 19th century German secularism, a feeling that traditional Judaism was too parochial and that all differences between people would soon enough vanish. More than anything else, these Jews wanted to assimilate as nearly as possible the culture, but not the religion, of their adopted country. They were eager to become Americans because integration was seen as the best guarantee against anti-Jewish prejudices, self-effacement, and low visibility as a separate group. And that was their aim over everything else. While well, Cincinnati's Jews were not unique in the United States in striving to become American in every way possible, they had an additional influencing factor. They were exposed on a daily basis to the most dominant Jewish religious leader in the country, who with his every breath called for Americanization of the Jewish religion, specifically Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise. It was his central theme of Americanizing Judaism that he consistently wove into his sermons, public pronouncements, and private conversations, as well as the institutions he founded. With Wise leading the way, it was the norm for Jews to completely identify as being American in their everyday life as any of their general, Gentile neighbors, while at the same time, totally comfortable as members of a different religion. The coming of the Russian and other Eastern European Jews beginning in 1881, brought about several changes in the social and cultural life of the community. The Russian and German Jews did not mix socially. The German Jews were already thoroughly Americanized when the Eastern European Jews came to Cincinnati. Again, quoting Brickner, the Russians possessed neither the secular Western culture nor social background of their co-religionists. The German Jews greatly feared that the Russian Jews would upset the position which they had worked so hard to attain in being accepted in the general community, end quote. While the German Jews had quickly given up speaking German on their arrival, the Russian and other Eastern European Jews were slow to learn English or abandon speaking Yiddish in their everyday conversation. Brickner goes on to say, the social relationship of the two groups was greatly strained by the fact that the Germans, or quote-unquote Yehudim, were the philanthropists and employers, where the Russians were the employees. Many of them were on the books of the charities founded, funded, and led by German Jews. As Polk Lafoon stated in his wonderful 1977 Cincinnati Magazine article on the divide between Cincinnati's German and Eastern European Jews, Quote, when the Eastern European Jewish interlopers arrived, they found charity from their established German Jewish brethren, in keeping with the Jewish tradition of taking care of their own, but not camaraderie. They were given food, but not asked to dinner. 
end quote. Interestingly, this divide greatly accelerated the establishment of social clubs, such as the Cincinnati Club, Los Sanibel, and probably even the board, because these clubs were seen as a way to elevate the status of the German Jews and distinguish them from the newer wave of immigrants in the eyes of their Gentile brethren. These clubs were patterned after, and in many ways parallel, the social clubs that very few Jews were permitted to join, including the Cincinnati Golf Club, the Country Club, the Avondale Athletic Club, the Commercial Club, and indeed the Literary Club. While they were excluded from some clubs, hotels, and resorts, as well as not being able to join several law firms and banks, or practice medicine at some of the larger hospitals, and even barred from several corporations like Procter & Gamble, Jews were indeed recognized as part of the social elite. This is evidenced by the fact that over 75 Jewish families were listed in Miss Clara Devereaux's prestigious 1912 edition of the Blue Book of Cincinnati Society. Here are some random observations from reviewing the 1912 edition of the Blue Book. There were 13 different Freiburg family listings and four Friedlander family listings. Of the over 120 individuals in the exclusive Cincinnati Women's Club, three Jewish women were listed, Freiburg, Friedlander, and Pollock. Of the four officers of the Women's Committee of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, which ran the orchestra, two were Jewish, Mrs. Walter J. Friedlander, who was vice president, and Mrs. Louise Stix, the recording secretary. In 1912, Murray Seasongood, at age 32, was vice president of the Downtown University Club. There were no Jewish members of the Commercial Club, the Cincinnati Golf Club, or the Cincinnati Riding Club. However, Dr. Joseph Ranzelhoff, Milton Adler, and Walter J. Friedlander were listed as members of a very exclusive club, the Country Club which was the forerunner of today's Cincinnati Country Club. Rabbi Max Lilienthal became a member of the Cincinnati Literary Club in 1869, and Simeon Johnson, grandson of one of the very first Jews in Cincinnati in 1819, was a member from 1886 until his death in 1957 of the Literary Club. For his article in 1977, Polk Lafoon interviewed Emma Fisher, daughter of Seti Kuhn, who related, quote, there was a story about my uncle Max. He was much interested in housing, and so was a Mr. Schmidlap. And through their work together, he and Uncle Max were friends. Well, one time Mr. Schmidlap asked Uncle Max and his wife to dinner, but he declined, saying, quote, you don't really want that, Mr. Schmidlap. We're friends, but not friends that way. She went on to state, the Jews of those days, I guess, really didn't want to expose themselves, did they? To the extent that Jews were interested in the fine arts and other intellectual pursuits, they experienced no difficulty in finding a place for all their interests and to serve on the boards of many of the city's most prestigious existing cultural institutions. Religious affiliation was not a disqualifying factor. Instead, talent, generosity and dedication were welcome on its own sake. Brickner summed up best the central theme pervading the Jewish community of Cincinnati in the years leading up to the founding of the board. Quote, the Jews of Cincinnati accomplished an adjustment to American life by selecting many of the finest qualities, ideas, and methods which they found in the lives of, the, of their Gentile neighbors and made them part and parcel of their own life. While continuing to actively maintain their own separate Jewish community, they contribute a rich portion to the totality of American cultural values and ideals. It is now my pleasure to personally introduce you to a few of the more prominent men who lived around the time of the founding of the board. My purpose is to provide examples of the lives these people led illustrating many of the facts presented up to this point. I will be reading excerpts taken directly from
from but a few of the many detailed sketches provided in Goss's 1912 Cincinnati of the Queen City. It is testimony to the importance of the Jews of the time that of the several hundred profiles of the most important individuals who had lived in this community for the first 110 years of its existence, well over 60 were Jewish. The admiration and respect that these people achieved is emphatically evidenced by the wonderful writing that I'm about to share. Arnold Iglauer, a well-known representative of the clothing industry in Cincinnati is Arnold Iglauer. When a lad of 12 years with an aunt, he emigrated to the United States in 1852. After attending Hughes High School, he went to work as an errand boy at age 16. Eventually, he became associated with Louis Wald in importing hosiery and other articles from Germany. This venture proved very successful. In 1879, Mr. Iglauer withdrew from the enterprise to go into partnership with his brothers-in-law, May and Jake Fetchheimer, in the manufacturing of clothing. In 1883, they operated, opened a, and operated a retail store on Fifth Street, which kept going until 1898, when upon the death, death of May Fetchheimer, they disposed of the retail store and incorporated under the name Fetchheimer Brothers Company with Mr. Iglauer as president of this concern. They now confine their entire attention to the manufacturing of uniforms. Their business has developed in a most gratifying manner and they now give employment to over 1,000 people. Mr. Iglauer was married in November 1870 at Plum Street Temple to Mrs. Delia Fetchheimer, the daughter of Samuel Fetchheimer, who was one of 12 brothers. To Mr. and Mrs. Iglauer have been born three children, Dr. Samuel, who specializes in ear, nose, and throat medicine, Charles, who's the general manager of the Fetchheimer Company, and Ruth, who is married to Theodore Workham, a dealer in automobiles. The family lives in a beautiful residence on Rose Hill in Avondale. He is another member of his race who came to America with but limited means and by his own remitting industry and ability to recognize opportunities has so intelligently directed his efforts that he is now one of the affluent citizens of his adopted country. Edward Sr. is a well-known capitalist and one of the foremost businessmen of Cincinnati. He has made his home here for more than 50 years. And few men of his age have contributed in a greater degree toward the growth and prosperity of our city. He received his education in the public schools and graduated from Hughes High School in 1866, and then embarked on the wholesale liquor business with his father, A. Senior. Through the son's efforts, this firm became one of the most prominent in the country. In 1904, Mr. Senior founded the Senior Powder Company with mills near Morrow, Ohio, uh, Morrow, Ohio, of which his son, Robert M. Senior, is the secretary and treasurer. Mr. Senior is also actively identified with many financial and business concerns. He is vice president of the Union Savings Bank and Trust Company, one of the largest financial institutions of the city, vice president of Clinton Springs Distilling Company, a director of the First National Bank, and a director of several other very large corporations. In 1878, Mr. Sr. married Laura Monheimer, and they have three children, Robert M., who was, by the way, a founder of the board, Clara and Agnes, who later became the wife of Maurice Seasingood. Mr. Sr. is a member of the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce and socially is connected with the Queen City Club, the Phoenix Club, the Cincinnati Club, and the Sanibel Country Club. Of a genial and pleasing temperament, he is one of the broad-minded and liberal hearted men of the city. Honorable Alfred M. Cohn, senior member of the well-known law firm of Cohn and Mack is one of the most prominent citizens and a leading politician of Hamilton County. He was first elected to the city council and during service in that body showed much devotion to the interests of the public against the demands of the corporations. And then he was elected to the state Senate on the fusion ticket in 1897. 
No man was more influential in the Senate than was Senator Cohen, meaning the approbation of all who believed in good government. In 1900, Senator Cohen was nominated for mayor of Cincinnati, and his influence is still felt in the protection of the people's rights. He's been, a cons he's been conspicuous in many Jewish societies, including being the founder of the Young Men's Hebrew Association and the prime mover in the movement to provide relief of the Russian refugees. He's also secretary of the Mound Street Temple, later known as Rockdale Temple, and a member of B'nai B'rith, a Mason, and an Odd Fellow. While he is outspoken in his con condemnation of what he believes wrong, he is known to be sincere, and there are few men in the city who have a larger following of personal friends. J. Walter Freiburg was born in 1858, a son of Julius and Duffy Freiburg. After graduating from Hughes High School, he began his active business life, life as a clerk with the firm of Freiburg and Workham in 1875. Eight years later, he was admitted to partnership as now the head of one of the most extensive manufacturing enterprises in this line in the entire country. For two years, he served as president of the National Wholesale Liquor Dealers Association. Moreover, he is a director of the First National Bank, as well as serving as director of the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce. In 1884, Mr. Freiburg married Miss Stella Heinsheimer. They now have one child, Julius W. Freiburg. They're very prominent in the social circles of the city. And Mr. Freiburg is especially well known and popular in fraternal clubs. For several years, he was president of the Phoenix Club in 1911, elected president of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations in New York City. He is typical businessman of the present day, alert, forceful, accomplishes what he undertakes, and no difficulty or obstacle is allowed to brook his path. He is a man of well-balanced character who gives to each important features of his life and gives them all due consideration. Judge Harry Max Hoffheimer has for eight years been one of the judges of the Superior Court of Ohio with three years more to serve. He has proved himself the peer of the ablest members who have sat upon the bench in that court. Throughout Ohio, Judge Hoffheimer is spoken of in terms of admiration and respect. Judge Hoffheimer is a native of Cincinnati, his father Max having been a member of the old and well-known firm of Hoffheimer Brothers. He graduated from Hughes High School in 1886 and after pursuing a special course at Harvard in 1887, he qualified to attend the Cincinnati College of Law, of which he is a graduate of the class of 1889. After practicing law for 10 years, he was one of two Republicans elected to the 74th General Assembly of Ohio, the other being the Honorable Nicholas Longworth. However, before his term was completed, he resigned to accept the nomination for county prosecuting attorney. His easy election proved that he was a popular choice and in completion of his first term was reelected to a second and, then, and a third. Before the completion of that term, as prosecutor, the governor nominated him to fill a vacancy on the Superior Court bench. Subsequently, he was elected to two more terms in that capacity. He is recognized as a man of well-balanced intellect, thoroughly familiar with the law. He is possessed of an analytical mind and self-control while displaying the disposition of dignity, impartiality, and equality in protecting life, prosperity, and liberty. The family is a member of the Rockdale Temple, and for many years he has taken one of, been one of the trustees following in the heritage of his father, who had been an officer as well. Judge Hoffheimer is also a member of the Board of Governors of the Hebrew Union College. He's affiliated with several masonry lodges, as well as a member of the Queen City Club, University Club, and the Sanibel Country Club. Benjamin Pritz, this was my great-grandfather. Benjamin Pritz, who departed his life on May 11, 1909, was born in 1853 in the small village of Demelsdorf, Germany. He was the youngest of eight children, all of whom, with the exception of his sister Fanny, made their way to the New World at the encouragement of their parents, 
who did not hesitate to send them forth to the Western land of opportunity. At the age of 13 in 1866, he came to Cincinnati to live with his older sister, Babette Simon. In spite of the handicap of not knowing the English language, he graduated high school in 1869 as an honor student and the winner of the prize for outstanding student. He became the bookkeeper of Senior Strauss and Company and remained there until 1875 when he joined with his brother-in-law, Isaac Strauss, and his brother Solomon Pritz to form the firm of Strauss, Pritz and Company. The, the successful career and high reputation throughout the United States of this firm has been a matter of common knowledge to all who are acquainted with industrial Cincinnati or with distilling interests throughout the country. His career was that of the energetic, resourceful, high principled man of business. He was often called upon by businessmen to arbitrate and adjust the differences that might exist between them. When directorates and committees, he was respected for speaking his mind clearly. And there was always the feeling on the part of those with whom he dealt that the sole motive behind his word or action was his abiding sense of right and fairness. He was, he was of charitable nature in his giving knew no barrier of religion or race or color line. Among the organizations which he belonged were the Phoenix Club, the Bankers Club, the Los Angeles Golf Club, the Chamber of Commerce, where he served on several important committees, number 133 of Masons, Congregation K.K. B'nai Yashurim, of which he was a trustee for a number of years, and the University School of Cincinnati, which he helped organize and was also a director. For years, he was also a director of the Equitable National Bank, and at the time of his death, was director of the Providence Savings Bank. He died at Atlantic City while barely having passed middle life after an extended illness, which he met in the same spirit that characterized his entire existence, a spirit of cheerful courage and serene patience. Some closing thoughts. It is entirely appropriate that the final message I leave you with this evening underscores the high level of respect that other prominent citizens had for the Cincinnati Jewish community of that era. Therefore, the last words come from none other than the President of the United States in 1912, William Howard Taft, a Cincinnati native. Quoting Taft, everyone who lives in a community like that of my home city of Cincinnati knows that none of the great charities, none of the great museums, None of the theaters, none of the societies of art, artistic development, or music could thrive if it were not for the support of the Jews of that city. For this reason, I believe it to be true that Jews are a most important part of every vibrant community in America." End quote. If Walter Cronkite was with us this evening, he would likely close this episode of You Are There with something like this. What sort of a day was it in 1912 when the board was founded? It was a day like other days, filled with the events that alter and illuminate our times. And most importantly, you were there. Thank you for your time. Jim, thank you so much for bringing those, uh, those Cincinnatians to us and their stories and our history. Um, we have uh, a couple questions. Um, the first one is um, sort of a, a definition of Cincinnati. Is Cincinnati does Cincinnati at this time include um, Northern Kentucky? And maybe we can add in, you know, um, uh, Eastern Indiana, or even you know, up into the northern suburbs. What's the what's the limit of Cincinnati at this time? Well, Cincinnati would have included um, in, into Northern Kentucky. I mean, generally when people would say they were from Cincinnati, they would include that. But the Jewish community was very concentrated at that time. Um, downtown and Avondale were uh, the extent of where the Jews lived. And Avondale was a very new suburb by 1912. 
my great grandfather, Benjamin Pritz, built a house uh, on Reading Road in 1904. Um, and his next door neighbor who built the house next to him was Barney Kroger, the founder of the Kroger Company. Amazing. Um, Thank you. One of the things I did not point out in the paper, um, we talk a lot about assimilation, Americanization. Uh, the intermarriage rate, from the best I can tell at that time, was less than 5%. Today, among non-Orthodox, it's approaching 70%. So there was not assimilation in the sense that Jews were going off and being Christian or, or just nothings. They, they remain Jews. So it was perhaps more like acculturation. Yes. Amer I keep calling it Americanization. Mm. Um, another question we have is about uh, kind of bringing us back to the 21st century, which is, is the board still all male? It is all male. It's 60 men. Um, and there has been from time to time talk about uh, having women, but it's never really gained any strong traction. Interestingly enough, the Literary Club of Cincinnati, which goes, which goes back to 1849, is all male, it's 100 men, and they have had um, some serious votes to admit women, but so far have not, just like the Women's Club of Cincinnati is still all women. Thank you. Um, oh, Barbara, Barbara, you remuted yourself, so you'll have to unmute again. Okay. There you go. Okay. Jim, uh, I'm Barbara Liss. I'm the uh, the widow of Herb Liss. I think you knew him. I did. Um, we came to Cincinnati in the late 1960s and uh, we joined a club of all um, local Jewish people, uh, women and men, the Maj Poker Group. And um, they kept on saying to her, and Herb came, we came because Herb uh, was with P&G. And they, the, the local men would say, oh, Herb, do they know you're Jewish? Do they know you're Jewish? You know, how can you work for P&G? And, uh, you know, we got, he got scared. But then there were other people there whose names, I mean, our name is Liz, but there were people there whose name was Levy and Gendel and uh, Zeltner. And, and then we figured out it's because most locals would go into business with their parents and their parents and the local Jews, and they never really tried uh, to get into P and G because they decided they couldn't. So uh, you you said there weren't any Jews, and well, there up, were up until the early night. From my understanding, and I actually did work for Procter and Gamble for a, a brief time in my early. You did days. too. <laughs> I did for a very brief time, but there were really no Jews who had risen to any prominent position until the early. What do you 1960s. mean? We had vice presidents until the early nineteen sixties. We had vice presidents. Sandy Weiner was in line to become president. Okay, and we were there in the so, early 1960s. So and Bob We Gold were there in the early 1960s. Yeah, but there were there were very yeah. few Jews who, who got best being a brand manager until the early 1960s. And, and we, Weiner and Weiner? Wait, Weiner was yeah, there. Yeah, so I hear what no, you're saying, that it was the early well, 20th century. He, he, didn't, he didn't get to where he was until about 1974. So anyhow... Your point is right. Jews were at Procter & Gamble, but not in any great numbers until the early 1960s. It was a very exclusive. exclusive okay. Time. And, the, and the banks also in this city, okay. to this day, do not employ very many Jews. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there, um, are there any other last minute questions? Um, Thank you. Yeah. Before, um, before Bobby, Bobby Hanwer, answer ahead. any other questions, I, I would like to introduce somebody who is on the call with us tonight, Marie Krulowitz-Brown. Uh, Marie is 
occupying a very important position in our community. Some of you may know, but if you don't, you're gonna hear a lot about it, of the Jewish Cincinnati Bicentennial celebrating 200 years of Jewish Cincinnati, commemorating the first formal organization in the Jewish community, which was the establishment of the Chestnut Street Station, uh, Cemetery in 1821. And this fall, we will be kicking off a year long celebration. And if it's okay, I'd like Marie just to say hello and tell you just a couple of minutes since it's in line with the theme of what we're talking about tonight of how we plan to celebrate 200 years of Jewish Cincinnati. Thanks, Jim. And apologies, everyone. I'm joining from my phone. I just got back from taking my son to a student show and it ran late this evening. Um, it's nice that live theater is emerging safely um, now. So thank you, Jim. I got to catch the last 20 minutes or so of your talk. It was really interesting. And I'm sure all of you have heard and gotten a fair context of how significant um, life was for Jews in Cincinnati and especially in the early 19th century, Jews were really able to establish themselves in ways that um, they weren't so much able to do in Europe or elsewhere. And so the Bicentennial celebrates 200 years of Jewish life in Cincinnati. Um, and we'll be, Jim mentioned, we'll be kicking off this fall um, in September with a formal rededication of Chestnut Street Cemetery. As Jim was mentioning, it's the oldest cemetery west of the Allegheny Mountains. And it was really that, um, that was the impetus of formal organization of Jews. And I'm sure Jim gave you much of the history that Jews were here before that. Um, but we are, we are taking advantage of this really, truly once in a lifetime opportunity and milestone. And we have planned a year long of celebrations and programs. We are still in planning um, we've been quiet and haven't been promoting um, very much publicly yet because we're still very much working um, diligently to line things up and with immense um, thoughtfulness and consideration around COVID, we wanted to make sure that we were rolling out communications thoughtfully um, and in consideration of, of everything that's been going on in the past year. So you will certainly be hearing more about these celebrations and programs and events. Um, I would say later this summer, uh, we'll start to really drum up buzz, but you can look forward to many arts and cultural um, programs and experiences. I, I got the tail end of Jim's talk where he mentioned the very strong connection that Cincinnati Jews have had on arts and culture in our region. And so look forward to performances and programs from the CSO, from Cincinnati Ballet. There will be a beautiful collaboration between the Art Museum, the Ballet, and the Aerial Quartet, um, which are the artists in residence for CCM right now, um, as well as Playhouse in the Park is doing a couple of shows. Um, Cincinnati Museum Center is a major partner and they'll be hosting a six month long uh, Jewish Cincinnati exhibit. So there are several other events and programs coming. That's just a taste, a snippet, but from this September, 2021 through October of 2022, there will be a myriad of opportunities for you to get involved, to participate and learn more about the truly significant impact that Jews have been able to have on the Ohio River Valley. So thank you, Jim. And um, certainly over the coming months, there will be more opportunities to ask questions too. But if you have any, I'm happy to answer any. Thank you so much, Marie. I'm, I'm so excited for this whole bicentennial and, and all the celebrations. Um, I want to make sure before we move questions on to you that we finish up questions with Jim. Um, um, and Bobby, um, you said you didn't have a, a question, but you have a comment. So if you want to Go ahead and share. Oh, okay. The, the neighborhood in Amberley Village where, uh, where I live and where the Hordies live was uh, developed in the um, late 1930s, early 1940s as an enclave, as a residential enclave for p and Gers, and uh, it had a restrictive covenant that barred Jews. So Jews were not allowed <laughs> to, to own homes in our neighborhood, which is now very Jewish. <laughs> There were several neighborhoods like that. Um, a friend of mine who worked for many years at the Jewish Federation bought her first house in Madeira. And 
And when she bought it, there was a covenant uh, in the deed that she had that said the Jews cannot own that house. Right. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Bobby. That's, that's fascinating. Um, and ironic, a bit ironic. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see, I just want to take a look and see if there's anyone else who might have a last comment or question, either for Jim or Marie. I, I'm just curious whether the people on the call uh, were um, aware of some of the cultural uh, facts that I pointed out before this evening. Was, was any of this new or were people pretty aware that there was a quite prominent uh, presence in the city uh, 125 to 150 years ago of the Jewish community? Yeah, I, I was aware of it, but only after I moved here. <laughs> because when we when we moved here, we my husband and I moved here in 1990, and I met people who could trace their families in Cincinnati back four and five and six generations, and that was uh, you know my family has uh, Eastern European and in, and in, in origin, and so that was just you know to to find Jews who could who <laughs> you know who had. Um, had, whose families had been here for for generations was a real um, was a real surprise. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that surprised me with your with your presentation was how integrated Jews were into the cultural world of Cincinnati. Because when I've studied the history of Cincinnati, it's usually about the uh, you know, where, where Jews were not allowed to be, right? This is why the Jewish hospital was created. And this is why, you know, we had to have this separate organization, that separate organization. But you kind of presented this other picture of just Jewish hospitals, what, 1840. So um, just 60 years later, there's so much um, just like conversation and talking between these different these different groups of people, maybe not on David an institutional Man level. But hmm? Is David Mann Jewish? I don't know. No, he's not. Oh, he's, oh, he's not. not. Okay. Fine. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, Jim, um, we all remember uh, saving Soviet Jewry back in the 1980s, and it was quite successful getting a lot of Jews to come over here from Russia. Uh, what was it like? I mean, not, not, I'm sure you remember personally, but what was it like in the 19, late 30s? Was there a, a concerted effort by a German Jewish residents of Cincinnati to try and get Jews out of Germany? Yes, there was. In fact, um, my stepfather, his name was Milton Schloss, uh, and ran uh, a very large meat company called Kahn's, uh, personally sponsored several people who uh, came over under his sponsorship. and. Sarah Weiss, uh, who runs the uh, Center for Holocaust and Humanities Education, uh, has devoted a, a good deal of research to the Jews of Cincinnati in the 30s, who uh, made an effort to bring uh, German Jews to Cincinnati. And you all may be familiar with uh, the Jewish Vocational Service. It really became an entity in about 1938 to find ways to uh, employ and give jobs to the German refugees who were coming over in uh, a fair number by 1938. And uh, that's what created the original workshop. JBS eventually evolved into a workshop for people with uh, disabilities, but initially it was there to give jobs to uh, refugees who were coming in from Europe in the 30s. Whether it was as much as it could have been done to answer the question a different way, that remains to be seen, but there certainly was a concerted effort. Um, not sure how organized it was, but there were people who stepped up. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, so I wanna be respectful of the time. It's um, about 8.35. So I think what we may do is sort of officially end, if that's okay, Jim. Um, sure. 
And then um, if there are people who would like to sort of unofficially stay on for more questions, if that, again, if that's okay with you, Jim, um, we can, uh, I'll leave the, the room open and stay here on as well. Um, so thank you, Jim, for being here, for answering all of our questions, for helping us um, uh, sort of um, break, break the ground for Northern Hills to get into the bicentennial um, celebration and, uh, and for bringing these, these people and these, this history to us. I, I wanna recognize another gentleman on the call, Dan Randolph, who is a real expert in sewage, Jewish Cincinnati history too. And he, he knows tremendous amount about uh, the origins of lots of the institutions in this community. And uh, Marie, he will be a great resource for us with the 200th anniversary. Hope you, I hope you'll volunteer your time, Dan, because you can certainly use it. Yes, and, and Marie and Dan, um, if you would like me to make an email introduction between the two of you, just give me a thumbs up. Awesome, okay. Sure, well, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so we are officially ending our, our presentation on the apex of the Gilded Age. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. And then um, I will ask unofficially if anyone has any other questions for Jim. Or comments, yeah. One, one of the comments I would make, I, sh I should have made it during the talk is, I make the very bold without any definitive scholarship statement that in my humble opinion, and Dan, you could correct me, Jews were more prominent in more phases of this community in 1912 than they were in 2012 or certainly in 2021. If, if you look around at the, the broad spectrum of, of organizations, uh, politically, financially, in the, um, the arts, uh, yeah, Jews are prominent today, but I just kept seeing head turning everywhere I looked to how incredibly influential Jews were in the early 1900s throughout the community and in lots of places that, that were not today. One example is the banking industry. Absolutely. We were everywhere. Very quiet. We, we, we participated in everything we could and Chrome Conservatory is one. If you look at that, uh, the, the Jewish camp we have that has moved out of Indian Hill over to Indiana. That was very important. We did many things. If you look at the entire history of tailoring the, the, the clothing industry in, in 1865, almost 95% of all tailors were Jewish. Right. That slowly disappeared. We were very influential. We kept going. Eckheimers were very prominent. We did many, many things and we're still here. We haven't stopped. Some people want to be known. Others just did their part and participated. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of compiling a list of companies um, from the 1800s on that had a national presence um, coming, you know, that were Jewish owned in Cincinnati. I'm up to well over 40. Oh, easily. Uh, Manischewitz is one right. that very prominent, and that kept going through the um, A.B. Wise company. And, but but we were very prominent in the world. The, the liquor business itself was just unreal. And there is there is a book that's been published on uh, basically the, the Jews and booze, right. how much we participated. If you ever consider how many people and how much alcohol was produced in Cincinnati. Right. Or, United States distribution, it was staggering. The, obviously, the Volstead Act stopped a lot of that in 1919, but we, we had a very big influence. And if you look at Albert Sabin, he's another individual. He, he was very prominent. People don't appreciate how significant he was. We, we just don't stop, but not everybody wants to be recognized. Not everybody wants to stand out. But this, this is part of what we're going to be uh, celebrating at the Museum Center. Um, and we're working closely with them. And they, they're great partners as we reset to, to make sure that, uh, that people understand. And, and there's another element Marie talked about uh, 
many of the exhibits, but there's going to be one at the Skirball Museum featuring lots of prominent Cincinnatians in portraits um, that people have in their homes today of people who lived 100, 200, 150 years ago. Without trying to plug the Cincinnati Museum Center, they are very quiet, but they have an extremely large Jewish library and a Jewish collection. They just don't have the people to have the curators there. They don't have the people to put anything on display. They don't have the people to work with the material, but it is extremely extensive as to what the collection is. Well, I, and, I'm sitting in on several meetings with them, Dan, and they're mining it thoroughly now. They're doing yeah, what they're, they, they have neglected for many years, and they have several people spending a significant amount of their time they, they, they also, what they've got. They have a very large collection of Manischewitz material. They know that. And I will put yeah. Cook in, or uh, uh, I'm going to say just a comment. At one time, the Cincinnati Jewish Center, when it was in Avondale, had a very large and significant symphony orchestra back in the 30s. People don't appreciate that we actually had a very significant orchestra there. It was very important. But it's disappeared. We don't pay any attention to that anymore. Things have changed. We we made contributions, and we still make contributions, and we're not stopping. Well, and there's a that's lot. We're, we're celebrating the past. We're celebrating the present, and we're celebrating the future with the 200th bicentennial. So it's not going to be limited to just being a historical look back. It's going to be celebrating the continuation of Jewish contributions to the betterment of our community. I'll put in a plug for Children's Hospital. If you look at Mark Rothenberg, what he's doing to correct diseases, certain diseases with children, it's staggering. And he flies back and forth from Israel every couple of weeks. He's in Israel right now. When they had all the flare-ups, he decided he was going to go back. So he's over there right now. But he's actually very active with Children's. He lives in Cincinnati and in Renana. And he's making contributions to improving the health of children. We have many people like that that don't stop. We even had Jewish steel makers, if you go back far enough. And Cincinnati was a very large steel producing area. Pollock Steel. Yes, Pollock Steel was one of them. And he did a great job. In fact, Emil Pollock, I think, was a member of the board, one of the founding members of the board. Right. Mm -hmm. so our contributions don't stop. They go on and on and on. Rabbi, I want to thank you for putting this on. It's really a treat. And um, Ruby and I appreciate uh, that we can instill this idea and hopefully you'll promote it within uh, Northern Hills. And actually, Marie, aren't we going to be an inviting each synagogue to do their own programming around their own history? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're also putting out micro grant opportunities for community organizations of any size, any location to, to lean in um, and, and offer something interesting uh, in honor of this celebration. So it could be a lecture, it could be a collaboration with another organization. Um, we're looking to um, engage as diverse a community representation as possible. So both certainly for Cincinnati Jewish community, but certainly as well beyond. So um, we hope you'll get creative and absolutely participate. That would be super meaningful. Yeah, that's really exciting. We actually um, have been talking with the American Jewish Archives about creating a synagogue archive because um, I was given permission to quote this. I don't know if this is quotable for the Israelite Carol, but I'm going to quote it for, for here, which is, um, um, so, so Dana Herman, who is one of the archivists, I, she's not an archivist, but she works for the archives, says, I would like to tell you that we have a large, extensive collection of Northern Hills um, materials, but that would not be true. So we are working to collect materials that either you all have in your homes or you know, we're going to um, invite some people who have been members for a long time to kind of go through the materials that we have in our in our um, in our building and donate it um, as much as we can to the archives so that we will be kind of protected in the history. 
so that's really uh, a really good sort of um, connection between what ISH is doing, or sorry, not ISH, but what the Bicentennial is doing is what we're doing. Um, also, to plug another program, ISH, for whom Marie is the executive director, um, will be uh, participating in our Elul program series, which we're putting on again this year, um, which is a, um, a daily program throughout the month of Elul, right before Rosh Hashanah, where we'll be um, different presenters will be presenting on something and we'll have the opportunity to hear the shofar being blown every, every day. So yes, lots of, lots of really exciting things coming up. Um, so yeah, so I will, when I put this um, video out, which will probably not be in this week's weekly email, but next one, I'll also include links to the Bicentennial page to, um, to, Whatever I'll I'll listen back and listen to all the things that we've that we've plugged here. So um, we'll have lots of resources. So thank you all for being here. Um, I and thank you Jim for the amazing presentation and for bringing us so much stuff. For Marie for being here and for everyone else for joining us.